Well, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you on this first Sunday in December. Um, it is December, yeah. Can I give you a warm welcome? And uh, trust that you'll enjoy our time together of corporate worship. The Lord is with us. Um, and that's the most important thing, isn't it? That's the most important thing. Um, God's people have always gathered in worship. That's part of our, if you like, regular, part of the regular expression of who we are, really. We come together because not we are because, not because we are anything special in and of ourselves, but we have a saviour who is without equal. Yeah, we have a save, we have someone who saves us, we have someone who puts us together. We have someone who picks us up when we've fallen down. Amen. We have someone who sustains us. Amen. We have someone who keeps us and guards us. Yeah. We have someone who's preparing a place for us. Yeah. And that's the reason we gather together. You know, we might be sometimes, and we are, aren't we, weary. We might um, be in mourning. We might long for comfort. We might fail. We might feel weak. But we come to the very source of everything we need as we gather together. Yeah. We come to look to the one who supplies all our needs. And what does it say in the word? According to his riches in glory. And the wonderful thing is that his riches in glory are Amen. endless. They're, they're limitless. <coughs> so as we gather this morning, we're not, just, we're not just glad to see each other. We're glad to be in the presence of Jesus. Um, Let's have a look at Isaiah and chapter 9. You know this section very well. It's one of our well-worn passages for anticipating Christmas. For anticipating again the gift of God that he has given us in Christ. This is what it says. From verse, I'll read from verse 1, but you, you, know, you know it. But there will be no gloom... For her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy at harvest. As they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and evermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. 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 A wonderful exposition, if you like, of anticipation. Anticipating the Saviour. Anticipating, for, for, for Israel, anticipating restoration. Anticipating a time when God would come and heal their wounds. And of course, we see the fullness of that in the gift of His Son, Jesus. We celebrate that. Not only at Christmas, but every day and every week as we pattern our lives on Jesus himself. He is our saviour. He is the one who has come to be one of us. <laughs>
abandoned, lost and godless, wandering a trackless waste.
you, Jesus. Let's worship the Lord together. Thank you, Jesus. We give you thanks and praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again on this, the first day of our week. And Lord, we're reminded that it is only by grace, Lord, that we stand before you. It's only by your grace, Lord, that we continue day by day. Lord, we thank you that if that's not the case, Lord, we don't just fade away. Lord, we go from being in the body to being present with the Lord. So, Lord, the future holds no fear for us in that sense. But, Lord, we're grateful today, Lord, to revel in the truth of your goodness and your grace. We're grateful for the measure of health and strength you've given us. We're grateful more than that, Lord, for Jesus. And we thank you that even as we have sung about Emmanuel, Lord, we thank you that he is more than just a sign to us. Lord, in Israel, he was a sign. A young woman would give birth to a child and he would be called Emmanuel. And that would be a sign to the nation that he had not finished with them yet. That God had not finished with them. But Emmanuel to us is more than a sign. He is the saviour. He is God with us. And Lord, we stand together today in the presence of God with us. Knowing more than that you are with us, knowing even that you are for us. And no matter how we are, Lord, we might feel broken physically, we might feel under the weather emotionally, we might feel in a hundred different states. Lord, we know that you are for us. You have committed yourself to your people. And Lord, you've made that evident through the gift of your son. You've made it concrete by entering into a covenant with us. And you've sealed that covenant with the blood of Jesus and with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you've made an unbreakable covenant with us as your people. So Lord, as we've gathered this morning, Lord, we ask that you would help us to worship you. That you would grant us, Lord, the continuing illumination of your spirit that you would help us, even as we've gathered in your name. Lord, as those folks near the end of the life of Jesus came to the disciples and said to them, Sir, we would see Jesus. Lord, so we desire again with the eyes of faith to see you high and lifted up amongst us. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to come to God's Word, and I want to encourage you in our journey through the book of Exodus once more. But as we often do, it's important that we approach that rightly, and it's important that we gather under God's Word with hearts that are ready to hear. Thankfully, because of our reception of the Gospel, because of God's grace to us, we are what Jesus said in this parable, and it's good soil, we are, our hearts are good soil. But we do, want, you know, we do want to make sure that our ears are open today. It's important that we recognise that God presences himself with us by his spirit. By his spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, as we come to your word, we just ask that you would open our hearts and our ears. Lord, we recognise that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Lord, we want to be able to hear you correctly today. We want no impediment, Lord, between you and any, anybody else. So, Lord, we confess our sins and failures before you. Lord, we ask that you would cleanse us from them. We ask you that you would forgive us. We ask that you would again be merciful to us. Lord, we ask that you would grant us all the freedom and the peace that comes by virtue of our relationship with you through your Son. 
We ask all of this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Please turn with me to the book of Exodus and chapter 35. We enjoy great blessings as God's children. You don't look convinced, but we do. We enjoy, we enjoy great blessings as God's children for the sake of Jesus. In our Bible study on Thursday night, we were looking at some of the last verses in 1 John. They were essentially on how John dealt with the, the theme of sin. One of his big subjects, really, all the way through that first letter, is sin. And there's a wonderful verse in there that really speaks to the purpose of why our sins were forgiven. Why our sins are forgiven. You know, we've just confessed sin, haven't we? We've confessed that we're not perfect. Confessed that we're not um, perhaps as steadfast as, as we should be. You know, we feel the, the frailty of our, of, of our humanity. But one John encourages his readers and he just says, you know, remember that your sins are forgiven. And it says this, these words, for his name's sake. For his name's sake. You know, sometimes as Christians we have nothing at all to commend us before God. Except what we have been given through Christ. And yet we will still be forgiven. Because of what Jesus has done. We will be forgiven for his name's sake. I want to read from verse 30 of Exodus 35. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship. To devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood. For work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen or by a weaver, by any sort of workman or skilled designer. Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. There are apparently many ways to learn. Learning methods the way people grasp new information have changed. Now I notice this, and I'm sure you do, uh, the older that you get. I notice it in particular when I talk to my grandson, Harry. You know, I pick him, I'm, pick, I pick him up regularly to help in his sort of childcare. I pick him up from school, and usually the first question is, what have you learned today? What have you done in school today? And after he's told me what he's had for his lunch, because that's always high on, the, high on the priority list for all of us, isn't it? What we've had for lunch. And then say, well, what did, you, what did you learn? And, of course, he goes into, you know, he's done his topic work, or he's done history, or he's done English. But his favourite subject to talk about, I um, don't know how long this will continue, is maths. is mathematics. And, as I say, it's plain to me that as he talks about what he's learning in maths... The people don't learn maths like they used to. 
Or certainly, people don't learn maths like I used to. Um, back in the day. Now, if you're, if you're like me, I don't know who's, don't know who's around my age, but, or, or you know, some, a, few, a few of us are. For me, at least early on, it was all to, we all learned by what we call learning by rote. Do you remember that? We learned by repetition. I mean, who remembers such things as your times tables? Yeah. Who learned them by rote? Who learned them? Just, you know, just by repeating them and repeating them. Most of us did. Yeah, some of you can't quite get your arm up high enough, but yeah. <laughs> I, I saw the raised eyebrows, so that's good enough, okay? Now, of course, you remember, of course, I don't know if your school was like mine. Um, in case you're wondering, it was not back in the days of blackboard and chalk on an individual <laughs> table. Um, we had books. But we used to beat out the rhythm. Yeah. And you used to say, I'm ready after three. <laughs> One, two is two. Two, twos are four. Three, twos are six. Well done. We won't go any further because I don't want to stress anybody. Okay? <laughs> We learned, we learned by that constant rote and repetition and that beat all the way up to, some of us learned to our 10 times table, I guess. Some of us learned to 12. I always wondered why we stopped at 12. You know, we, never, we, we never really went to 13. Maybe, maybe in private school, they go to 13 and 14 and 15. Maybe that's like a little bit extra you get if you have a private education or if you're in a, or, it's what they call private education, public school, isn't it? But yeah, that's, that's another thing. We won't go into that. We had to have things repeated to us. Now, I'm told by my grandson, who's, who's a bit of a whiz at maths and he enjoys it, that they don't do that so much nowadays. That they do different things, they have different ways. And certainly when I've tried to help him with uh, what we used to call sums back in, back in school, division and multiplication, he, they even do that differently. You know, and so I'm trying to tell him the way that, that I learned, and he's saying, Granddad. You know, that, that's, that's, that's so old-fashioned. <laughs> this is the way we do it today. And he sort of does a little squiggle and he, he does something else. And, you know, totally different. Well, we've seen in Exodus, haven't we? We've seen the idea, and, in, and indeed we've seen lots of examples in Exodus of learning by repetition. It's interesting as you read the book of Exodus, time and time again you ask the question, why is this being repeated? And, of course, there are a number of reasons for repetition, even in God's word. There's repetition for the sake of emphasis. Important things get repeated. Now we do that, don't we? Yeah, my wife will often say to me, when I'm going to remember to get X or Y. That's the important thing. And my mum used to say that as well when I was a kid. It didn't make much difference. I would, she would often give me a list of things to remember to get to the shop and I would come back with completely different things. And, uh, that, and, that, and that still happens. But the important things in life often get repeated, don't they? And that's the same in terms of God's word. And it's actually the same in terms of the storyline of Exodus. But there's another reason, of course, things get repeated, particularly in terms of uh, the word of God to his people. And that is because of, as we've mentioned earlier, in terms of our prayers, the fact of human frailty. Sometimes God needs to repeat himself due to our capacity for slowness to believe or due to our forgetfulness, due to our fear and sometimes due, due to our downright waywardness. You know, that, that we are sometimes a little bit more interested in following our own path and we forget what God has spoken to us. It's a truism to say that all the way through the storyline of the Bible, God's people don't always get things right first time. And that was true for the people in Exodus, and it's true for us today, isn't it? Now in Exodus, we see some really important things repeated. Um, Moses, when he's called, he's called twice. And when he's first called, he doesn't think it's a good idea. No, oh, I don't want to go. The Ten Commandments, of course, are given twice, in a sense. The, you know, the, the tablets in particular, once they're given and then they're smashed and they have to be given again. And at least from our standpoint, huge sections of the book of Exodus are repeated, particularly in regard to the instructions for and the later construction of the tabernacle. This 
place for the dwelling place of God. And of course, one of the things that's repeated is the introduction of those who are called to manage and supervise the effort. Remember what's happened recently. God has given his people the instructions for his dwelling place among them. Then, rather than following those instructions, they went off and did their own thing. Yeah, they left God and, his, and the instructions for the tabernacle behind, and they worshipped around the golden calf. Then, as we've said before, we saw judgment and forgiveness. We saw grace from God. We saw renewal of the covenant. And at the start of chapter 35, we saw God constituting his people, calling his people together, and saying, yeah, you are my people. The whole congregation come together. And then we've seen them, particularly last week in terms of this idea of giving, we've seen them begin to work out their renewed relationship with God in terms of repentance. So last week we saw this reconciled people hearing and responding to Yahweh's call to give. And we said that was a characteristic of a grateful people. It was a characteristic of a repentant people. You know, we often ask ourselves the question, what is repentance? What is real repentance? And of course the Bible tells us. True repentance is that which is manifested in conspicuous acts of obedience. Now we're going to see this continued in our text this morning. As even today, as believers, we need to learn again to be reminded of what true repentance is all about. You know, we think about what we do when we sin. We think, well, what, what do I do? How, do I, how does God know I'm truly repentant? Is it, is, it, is it the level of remorse I feel? Is, it, is, it, is apology, is that, is that part of it? Is it about regret? Now, at some level, all those things are part of repentance, aren't they? You know, apology is often a verbal expression of repentance. It's an expression of, I've got something wrong. That's why confession of our sin is commanded in Scripture. It's important that we don't just think, oh, yeah, I've done something wrong. Yeah, sometimes we confess it. I got this wrong. <clears throat> But I want to say that the Bible says that repentance, in a sense, is very like faith. What is faith? Faith, faith comes by hearing. Yeah? It, is, it, is, it is a sense of receiving God's word and believing it and acting upon it. Well, in a sense, repentance is similar in that repentance is about renewed obedience. It's about a sense of renewed obedience. It's about vigorous Living, but not perfect obedience. Because actually, perfect obedience is beyond us in this life, I think. But in these verses here, we're going to see a little bit more of what the Lord does and says, particularly through this idea of moving toward the construction of the tab tabernacle. Because again, that was a work of a repentant people. They had to build what God had instructed them to do. They had messed up and built a golden calf, and now they wanted to get it right. So we see here, in the latter part of Exodus 35, just a couple of things. Firstly, we see another repeat. We see the repeated mention of a couple of guys. A couple of guys come to the fore. At the start of this section in verse 30, Moses says to the people of Israel, Look, behold, look at those two guys over there. Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and Aholiab. The son of Ahissamach of the tribe of Dan. There's a repeated mention of these two guys. Now we saw these guys mentioned in particular back in Exodus 31. Prior to the golden calf incident. They were, they were in a sense the people, the people that God had chosen to oversee and manage, to supervise, to get involved with the construction of the tabernacle. They, they were if you like the head craftsmen. And the artisans, they were, they were the ones who were going to be essentially equipped by God to build this worship structure, this place of sacrifice and sanctuary according to the pattern. <clears throat> Notice in these verses, of course, they're also noted as teachers. If you read these verses, it's not only that they're going to do the work, they're going to head the work up, they're going to teach others how to do it. In a sense, that's part 
of discipleship, isn't it? That we learn how to navigate our Christian lives. So there's a sense that we can learn that we're not only to do things, but we're to teach others how to do it. It's interesting, of course, that these guys were known and recognised. We're going to come to the fact of, the, the fact of their, their needing empowerment by God. But it's interesting that they're known. They're recognised. They're pointed out. You know, they've been given a job to do. And it, it isn't as if they just appear one morning, do the job and then swan off. How many of you, how many of you have got tradesmen involved in, in, in coming to do a repair at your house? And how many of us know the frustration of trying to get a, a reliable one? Someone who comes on time, someone who does what we want them to do and then, you know, goes away in, in reasonable time. It's much easier to find a tradesman that you know, isn't it? It's much easier that you, you trust somebody that you know and you recognise, someone maybe who's done a good job before. Well, in a sense, here Bezalel and Aholiab are are models, if you like, of recognised and accountable people. Men who were recognised in Israel and therefore given a job to do. I imagine that they had a, a background. I don't know whether Bezalel was a joiner or, a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or, or what particular trade he had, but I imagine he, he didn't just think, oh, I'm, go I'm going to construct the tabernacle. I imagine he had a bit of a, a background in that sort of work and, and a holly out too. But more than their background, there's something in the fact that they were recognised and pointed out which says that they were not only, they had a background, but they were also recognised as reliable. But you notice that that isn't enough. That's not enough to do the work that God has commanded them to do. Because secondly, there is a required empowerment. What does he say? Well, in verse 31 he says, speaking of Bezalel, but also applies to Holly. He says, he has filled them with the Spirit of God. And the idea here is that the Lord has filled them with his Spirit in order to accomplish the task that he has given them to do. So there is more in a sense than just a natural thing going on here. And I say that carefully. I don't mean that there's a massive gap between the spiritual and the natural in that sense. But certainly it is that in order to do God's work, to build the tabernacle in God's way, they need the empowerment of the Spirit. The Spirit has to help them. Of course, in Exodus, we see some of the first mentions of this idea of being filled with the Spirit of God in the whole Bible. We see the Spirit of God mentioned in the book of Genesis, right at the start. But as we get into Exodus, we, we start to get this idea of the Holy Spirit enabling, empowering people for certain tasks and ministries. And we see that continue throughout the, whole, the, the Old Covenant. The, the, the Spirit comes upon particular people, specific people, focused on a specific task or a specific ministry. So the particular ministries within the people of God as judges, as prophets, as priests, and as kings... We see this repeated focus of God filling them with his spirit. Sometimes with judges, it was despite sometimes their bad character, wasn't it? We see, we see it happening to people like Samson. It was not a great example of how to live as, as part of God's people, is he? Although he was called to be a deliverer. Yet in, yet in moments of need, in moments where... In a sense, God had determined that his people would have a victory. It says, the Spirit came upon Samson. All the way through the text of Scripture, we see this principle repeated that God's work actually requires God's enabling. Here in Exodus, Bezalel and Aholiab, these recognised and accountable guys, are enabled by God, empowered by God, to get the task of constructing the tabernacle done. And as I said, the emphasis here is on perhaps, if you like, an enhanced natural gifting. If you look at the, what they're actually in, in, given to do, it's all about carving and cutting and devising, devising artistic designs in verse 32, cutting stones, all this sort of, these natural abilities seem to have a supernatural enhancement. 
in order to do the very best for the work of the building of the tabernacle. And, and, and again, that continues. You see that actually all the way through into the New Testament where God uses people's natural abilities and, and enhances them at certain times. And of course, in the New Testament, we see more than that. We see a whole expanded idea of the empowerment of the Spirit. Something that actually doesn't come just on particular people, but is available for all of God's people. Not for the task of building a tent or a, t or a tabernacle per se, but for the, ta for the task of effective Christian living. We are part of our, if you like, birthright as, as New Testament believers, is that we are indwelt by the Spirit and we can be empowered by the Spirit, empowered for service. And those, <clears throat> if you like, the gifts that come along with that, well, sometimes Paul talks about natural abilities in that way. Of course, in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, he talks about particular supernatural abilities. And the idea behind them is what? Well, it's simply that the church will be built up. A Holiab and Bezalel are given enhanced natural abilities so that, so that the tabernacle can be built according to the pattern. We, as the God's people in the New Testament, have access to what the Bible calls the gifts of the Spirit, what Paul calls the pneumaticoi in, in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. And we are given them for the spiritual building of the church. They're not given for our benefit, in the sense of our personal benefit. They're not made given so that we might look good or even feel good about ourselves. We're given for the benefit of others. And in the New Testament, as in the Old, there is a requirement for empowered service. Bezalel and Holiab couldn't accomplish the task without the Lord filling them with his spirit. We, in a sense, cannot accomplish the task we are given without being filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, when we're, when we're looking again in the New Testament, perhaps at 1 Corinthians 12 and various other things, we can go into more of what that means for us. But there is a relationship, I believe. There is a precedent set for doing the work of God that requires the empowerment of the Spirit. That is set here, that's repeated in the Old Testament, and, there's, and then is expanded and transformed in the New so that it becomes something for all of us. One of the wonders of the new covenant, isn't it? Is that there came a time when the Lord said, I will pour out my spirit, not just on the one or two, not just on the three or four, but on all my people. Because we are all called and commissioned to take part in the upbuilding of his body. And so we all need that. That's why the encouragements in the New Testament are so regular. Be being filled with the Spirit. That's why the examples in the New Testament of people serving God, again, take that Old Testament form where it says, and you know, Peter stood up filled with the Holy Spirit. It's all about action. It's about service. It's about the fact that we need a required empowerment in our lives. And wonderfully, God is the God who will empower us. You know, we don't have to wonder about that in a sense anymore. We don't have to wonder, you know, well, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a priest, I'm not a king, I'm just an ordinary Joe. Well, there are no ordinary Joes in the kingdom of God anymore. We are all to walk according to the Spirit. Now, that's not a, particular, that's not a, a call to a particular li level of lifestyle. <clears throat> it's an understanding that we cannot be Christians without an experience of the Spirit. You know, there are no Christians who are, do not have the Spirit of God. They may, we may not have explored all the distinct operations of the Spirit. But we know that he dwells within us. And we can ask. And again, we've got <coughs> wonderful gospel examples of Jesus talking about this to his disciples. Uh, in a sense, about the gift of the Spirit. And saying, well, if you ask God to fill you with the, with, with the Spirit, if you ask God for the Spirit, will he give you something else? No, of course not. Because... God is good, and he's good to his children. 
Friends, in our lives, we need the enabling work of the Holy Spirit. And as I said, that's not just for an hour on a Sunday morning. It's not merely for you know, a, an encouragement, whether it's by tongues or prophecy or, or interpretation or whatever like that. Friends, sometimes the empowerment of the Spirit is about being able to stay faithful on really difficult days. It's about being faithful in, the, in, 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 in times of deep discouragement and difficulty. It's about, it's about being able to maintain joy in the Lord in the midst of some of the things that we all face in, 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 t in terms of sickness, in terms of death, in terms of disappointment, in terms of discouragement. How do we, in a sense, maintain a, a joyful perspective? Well, it comes, I, I honestly believe, because of the presence of the Spirit in us. Notice also, though, <clears throat> that there is something else. Because the empowerment of the Spirit here for Bezalel and the Holy App didn't mean that they could just say, well, I can now do my own thing. Whatever, whatever seems good to me, I can, I can do because I'm empowered by the Spirit. If you, if you look there in verse 36, sorry, chapter 36, verse 1, what does it say? It says, Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. You see, with this requirement of empowerment, there is still the ruling word. There is still the ruling command of God. It wasn't, well, there you go, Bezalel, away you go. Do what, you know, there's the plans, but, you know, if you feel a bit of, Ad living is necessary. If you want to add an extra, you know, an extra room or an extra level or something else, you know, feel free to do it. No, no. Bezalel had a pattern to follow. And he needed the Spirit of God to empower him to do that. Friends, we have a pattern to follow in life too. And we need the empowerment of the Spirit in order to, in a sense, keep the word as preeminent. I say this carefully. Truly spiritually empowered, truly spirit empowered people are not anything goes people. We are people who come under the rule of the word. You know, what, so in our lives, what, is, <coughs> what, what, what are we told? Well, we're told that in this new covenant, in our relationship with Jesus, we worship in spirit and truth. In other words, we worship Jesus in accordance with the way that God has directed us in his word. We walk according to the spirit. A recognition, walking and living in recognition of a work done by Jesus on our behalf. And a resolve to live that out. We'll see how in the, in the next chapters, and we'll go, be, be able to go a little bit quicker over these next couple of chapters... We'll see how the tabernacle was actually built according to the pattern. Remember what we said, God wants exclusive worship and he directs us how we are to do that. In the Old Testament and I believe in the New. We, in our lives today, still have the rule of the word. We still have the all-sufficient rule for life and faith. And our building might not be one made of cedar or blue and scarlet and different yarns. Our work is the whole of our lives. The whole of our lives built in view of the worship of God. Built in view of the sight of God over all things. Friends, we, as we walk together, need to be People who are recognised. We need to be people who are empowered. And we need to be people who are ruled by the word. We're going to respond to God's word as we look toward the table of the Lord. Again, something we're commanded to do 
in the word that helps us shape our worship. So we're going to stand together.
to die in our place and to rise again victorious over yes. sin and death and we thank you he is seated at your right hand interceding for yes, us Lord. we thank you Lord that this morning you rejoice over what your son has done <coughs> his work is perfect yes. and what he has done is great and he is worthy of all our praise yes. and we thank you Lord that you continue your work in us mm. with the help of your spirit oh Lord Lord you empower us Lord to grow in our knowledge of Jesus to grow in love, to grow, Lord, in godliness, to grow, Lord, in the things that our hearts desire, which is to glorify you with our, with our lives. Lord, we thank you that though we, we do fall many times, we thank you, Lord, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you, Lord, that you have promised to never leave us or forsake us. And Lord, that the work you began in us, you will complete. We thank you this morning. We really are blessed. And we do have so much to thank you for. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to gather around the table of the Lord as part of our worship. We know the scripture well, but it's important that we're reminded. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes stewards are going to serve us and let's approach the Lord's table together. Let's approach it in faith and let's approach it recognizing even here the work of the Spirit in our hearts. His work in illuminating us, in sustaining us, in floodlighting Jesus to us. His work even now to make this means of grace powerful in us as we approach the table. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong
Father, we are grateful for the truth that our lives are hidden with Christ in God. And that you have joined us forever with him by your spirit through faith. We thank you that we can confess that Christ is our saviour and our God. Even so, it has pleased you to reveal him to us, Father. And so to reveal yourself. Lord, we thank you that we can come before you in prayer. We thank you, Father, that we can ask for continued mercy upon us, upon those we love, upon our church, upon our nation. Lord, we pray for those in authority over us, that you would use them, Lord, even in our land, to promote righteousness, justice, and peace. We pray, Lord, for specific acts of parliament that are being consulted on at the moment. And we pray, Father, that you would just help, help us as your church to rise up and to stand for righteousness. Father, we think of your church scattered abroad. We think of those who are in situations of difficulty and suffering. We think of those who are serving you far from home and across cultures. We pray that you would bless and encourage them. Lord, we think of one another in our own church fellowship, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for making us part of your purposes by joining us to a local body of believers. Lord, we ask that you would sustain us and help us, Lord, even in these days. We think particularly of those who have asked us to pray for them. We think of those laid aside with sickness. Pray for our sister Pauline Perkins today as she's gone into hospital. Pray that you would just put your hand upon her and send your healing word. Amen. We think of um, our sister Jeanette and her daughter Carolyn, who have asked us to pray once more as part of Carolyn's treatment. Think, Lord, of um, Anne and Paul Farrington again. Lord, that you put your hand upon them in healing. Lord, we think of those who are laid aside, Lord, in terms of um, mental anguish and depression. We pray particularly for those that you would just grant light into their situations. Pray, Lord, again, for, pray for Emily, uh, Paul Haig's daughter, and pray for Paul and his family at this, <clears> at this time. Lord, that you would just minister into that situation and, and, and pour your blessing. I pray for his family, too, particularly for Andrea and the girls, that you would bless them with your salvation. Lord, that you would reach into that family and uh, invade their lives and, and uh, save them. Father, we pray that for our loved ones who don't know you. Pray for our sister Margaret Greenhill, away in Zimbabwe at the moment. And Lord, you know the situation that with flights and the difficulties in getting back home. We pray that you would just um, minister into that situation. Pray for Martin and, and Latricia as they um, seek to help in organising that. Lord, we pray as we look towards the celebration of Christmas. Lord, that you would Help us, Lord, again, another opportunity to, to speak for you, another opportunity to flood light and highlight the, the work of Jesus. Lord, I pray particularly, Lord, for the carol service in a couple of weeks. Lord, that you would help us, Lord, not only to enjoy that, Lord, and, and encourage each other, but Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to invite other people. Lord, that, that they would uh, be open and willing to those invitations. And Lord, that through the preaching of the, of the word, Lord, that you would bring fruit. Lord, we thank you for opportunities for, for witness in this um, Christmas period. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us in all, these, in all these ways. And for all these people, we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Holy 